Hi, how are you? Hi! Oh my God, I'm so it's excited. So, it's so amazing to see you and so extraordinary that we're so far away and here we are together. Thank you so much for saying yes. Thank you. I was just about to read your biography, but I have just 15 minutes and I'm just going to say what I think about you. And that is simply that you're a chief starting officer. I consider you a CSO, right? You're super good at starting projects and you do it amazingly. I, I was freaked out before this life about everything really. But then I remembered all the things you wrote in Poke the Box and wait, yeah, that. I remember all the things you wrote there and I said, this is going to be a compass for me. It's going to serve as a memory and I'm just going to have a conversation with you. And however it goes, it goes. By the way, you're a fun person, so it can't go that bad, can it? No, it can't. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you? I said you're a fun person, so it definitely would go well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, so since it's about starting, let's just start. So um, first things first, what's the story behind your yellow glasses? Well, I have this pair of yellow glasses that are less glare, but they're not quite as good a color. Which one do you like better? The yellow, the, ye the first one. Okay. Perfect, it's beautiful. But what's the story yeah, behind it? Why? Well, when you turn 50, you need glasses, no matter who you are. And I was used to looking at myself without glasses, so I went out and I got clear glasses because I was embarrassed about it. And I was like, I'm going to be wearing glasses for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm just going to own a pair of glasses that people remember. So there you go. Whoa, that is amazing. So first things first, right? Um, I hear a lot of people say, a lot of people are going to start stuff when we're done with this life. I trust that you're going to deliver on that. You're good at this. I mean, it's all you say, it's all you do, it's what you live and breathe. So how do we guide people on what to choose to start? Two things I'd say to begin. Number one, you have to start where you are, where you are. Where else could you start, but where you are? And saying, I can't start because I need to be over there is a way to hide. If your goal is to be over there, well then start going over there. But whatever it is, you have to start where you are. And then the second thing is seek out the smallest viable project. Do not come up with a business plan that needs $50 million in funding that's gonna change the whole world if you've never started anything before. Right? What's the thing you can do that would help three people? The thing that you would do could do that changes five people. That if you hear the stories of people who become successful entrepreneurs, their first business is almost always a lemonade stand. It's almost always shoveling snow. I don't think there's any snow where you are, but shoveling snow. And the point is find a small project, make a difference, and then do a bigger one. Amazing. So here in Nigeria, I can't speak for anywhere else, but here in Nigeria, we're taught to keep quiet. When you do something, when you speak out of tone, you're slapped, you know, like it's not even cool. It's not like shut up. It's a good slap. So we've been taught and we've been taught to conform. How do we unlearn the system? How do we fight the system? Yeah, no, it's a real problem. And it's a problem as well. Probably not as bad, but it's a real problem. And I wish I had a magic solution but changing the culture is very hard. If your projects are generous, it's easier to get people excited about them than if your project is hustling people. And so the goal of your project is, I have a key, you have a lock. If I lend you my key, you'll be able to open your lock. You'll be glad I did. Yeah. Right? And most people, if they're looking for something in the dark and you show up with a flashlight, will say thank you. And so the idea is to take those steps that aren't about you, but are about helping somebody else. Amazing. Oh, wow. Um, sometimes we don't start because we're scared of, you know, rejection, right? And this is something I've heard a lot of people say to me, blessing, I'm scared. What if they say no? So how do you, a lot of us set ourselves up first for no, right? So how do we earn the right to ask? How do we, yes, how do we earn the right to ask? I think that's the question. Oh, I thought you were going somewhere else. Let me start with that. Um, you're worried, we're worried that we're going to fail. Of course we're going to fail. People fail almost all the time. If you're into sports, more than half the people who show up lose the, the tournament, right? If you're talking about starting a business, almost everybody who starts doesn't win. If you're running for office, almost everyone is going to fail. So you start by acknowledging that this probably won't work, but it's still a generous thing to try. 
right? Yeah. And then this idea of how do I ask? The thing is, are you asking for you or are you asking for them? Hmm. And if you're asking because it will help them, then that's a fine thing to offer. If you're asking because it's going to help you, because it's important to you, it's really hard to find somebody who wants to engage in that. So what story are they telling themselves? What story is available to them so that that story is something that they want to engage in? Great. Wow, that is an amazing answer. So this is off the, off the topic, right? I'm about to ask a question that is off the topic. I've heard you speak about Apple in the past. Why do you love Apple? I mean, I love Apple, but why like, do you? Oh, the company? Yes, the company. Oh, I used to. I own it anymore. Oh, my God. Uh, why? I own, I own uh, many Macs and have been. I was a beta tester for Steve Jobs and Guy Kawasaki in 1983. So wow. I've been using Macs my entire career. Uh, back to this idea of the smallest viable audience and doing something that's remarkable. For a really long time, the people at Apple were groundbreaking in their focus on how to get people like me to be able to create beautiful objects, how to help people like me engage with an interface, engage with a computer, find more power, find more leverage. That's a choice. And in the last 10 years, their mission has been, how do I get more normal people to buy an iPhone? Because that's how they make their stock price go up. Oh. And you cannot argue with Tim Cook's goal of making the stock price go up. If that's your goal, it worked, right? He's allowed to run the company the way he wants to. But the Apple that I know wouldn't wait years and years and years before updating various computers or software. The Apple I know would have turned Keynote into a much more powerful product True. instead of letting it just fly fallow for five years. And so I have a brand disconnect because there's the Apple of my dreams that I remember. And then there's this consumer product company that I should have bought stock in, but I'm not their customer anymore. And they are consistent in saying, we know who our customer is now and we're making things for those people. Oh, wow. Sniff, sniff. I hope they hear you. Um, how, have you stayed <laughs> how have you stayed consistent over the years? The reason I'm asking this is I follow your blog. I follow your podcast. You're consistently releasing content, like consistently. And I just, how do you stay consistent? You're one of the most consistent people I know. So, you know, someone just answered in the, uh, in the comments, are brands allowed to change? Brands are totally allowed to change. They should just be coherent in saying, we are trying to accomplish this, so we're going to do that, right? And for me, I wanted to be able to say to people every day, I'll say something that you might know, but that you might be glad you were reminded of. Every day, I'll say something that you might want to share or not. And most of the time, when I can, I'll try to make it about the person who's reading it. And if you go to bed every night knowing that that's on your agenda for the next day, then it's more likely you'll be able to write something like that. So I only decide once to write a blog every day. Once you decide that blog to, to do that every day, after that, all you got to do is keep the promise. So funny thing is I recently wrote an article called Brush Your Teeth. And the concept was when you, when you miss brushing one day, it doesn't mean you stop brushing forever. You know, you just keep brushing. You just continue from where you stopped. Have you ever missed a day? Have I ever missed a day? Yeah, sure. I've missed a day when you wake up late or something or you forget, but you're exactly right. That's a brilliant analogy. Perfect. Brush your teeth every day. Yeah. Yay. Okay. Great to know I'm on track. So next question would be, how do you stay creative while you're creating? Because creating is important to stay consistent, but how do you stay creative while you're creating? So what does creative mean? Creating art, maybe? Like doing something that is I, not I usually think, done. That could be. I think creative means you made change happen. Yes. So if shipping the same thing isn't going to make change happen, but saying it differently will, you just did a creative act. Oh. So we come back to what, what change are you trying to make? Right? And be clear about what change you're seeking to make then you can find a creative solution that hasn't been tried that might not work about how to make that change. Great. 
So attention or trust, which comes first? I saw this somewhere, but I wanted you to really specifically tell me which comes first. Okay, so trust is the priceless asset of our time. Trust is in really short supply. But no one will trust you until they've heard of you, until a friend has recommended you, until they've seen you in the marketplace, until they've seen you showing up. And so we, if we misuse attention by spamming people, we've burned trust. On the other hand, if we earn attention, then we can make a promise and we can keep it. And that leads to trust. Great. So the reason I actually asked this question is with regards to showing your work, right? How do you, like, do you just focus on doing the work and not necessarily showing the work? And I'm thinking about this with regards to tunnels and bridges. What do you think about it? How important is it to show your work? Okay. So we're nesting a bunch of things here. Um, if you're showing your work to the wrong people, you're making a mistake. If you're showing your work to people who are trying to protect you by criticizing you, that's not helping. If you're showing your work to people who it's not for, that's not helping. On the other hand, if you're showing it to someone who's a generous critic, who is able to say useful things to make the work better, you need to show your work to those people because that's the only way to make your work better, right? Yeah. And um, the idea of tunnels and bridges was tunnels might not cost much more than bridges. Tunnels can be built uh, with much less disruption. And yet most city builders build bridges because they get all this credit for bridges. Tunnels are sort of invisible. And what I was trying to say is if you really care about making things better, be prepared to give away the credit. Be prepared to just build the thing without people noticing. Because if you do that enough times, you'll be able to weave something together. Amazing. So is quitting the same as finishing? Well, quitting is a form of finishing. It is just, it is appropriate when you quit so that you could do something else. Right? Yeah. So if you're quitting because you're afraid or you're quitting because you're tired, but you're not using the resources to go do something else, that's not necessarily as smart as quitting everything that you can so that you have enough resources to do a great job on one thing. Yes. Yeah. So how then do you know what to quit and when to quit? You have no idea, but you know you have to decide. So There's no formula. No formula. There's no way I can say, if it's like this, you should quit. And if it's not like this, you should keep going. You just need to know that you've been quitting all your life. And sometimes you quit at the wrong time. And sometimes you quit the wrong things. Look back. Look at other people who are ahead of you. What did they decide to quit or not quit? And look for clues. Look for symptoms. <sighs> oh, my God. That is such a wide answer. And that means it still rests on us to be able to decide, right? And we have to do this on purpose. Oh, my God. Do you have a question for me? I was, I was going to just ask more questions. But do you have a question? Well, my, quest my question for you is, you're doing extremely generous work. You've Thank assembled you. a large group of people who you are leading. Thank what you. is it about this work that excites you? So generally, I just noticed that a lot of Africans or Nigerians specifically do not know how to get their work seen. They don't know how to, you know, get their work on a global scale. And they're doing so much. They're like, they're instigating, but maybe not enough, you know? And so that was one of the things that made me happy. And so digging deeper, trying to figure out what is the problem, I then decided, I started realizing, oh, people are afraid to start. People are afraid to quit. People don't know how to take action. And that is why I have you here, you know, global thought leader, showing and shining the light. So this is really amazing. Thank you. Well, thank you. You're inspiring me every day. I really appreciate you stepping up to it. Thank you so much. So it's right on time. I mean, and I have to let you go because it's 15 minutes on the dot. So thank you so much, Seth, for joining in. You're the best. We'll see you soon. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.